diagram? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, like, what do you mean by are, are you, crazy? No, no, seriously. Uh, do, do, do you, do you, Come uh, on, buddy. Come on. Who, who are you? What do you mean, who am I? I don't know. You gave me the fucking mic. I got no. I didn't give you the mic. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I, I'm, I'm doing the mic, and let's, let's keep it, let's keep it civil in my space. I mean, yeah. Like what? No, no, man. You're in charge of the servers and the programming, whatever. Like what is uh, the uh, stack? Uh, 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 we, we Elon, keep things on, technical man. in my space, please. Take, take it, take it, take me from top to bottom. What does the stack look like right now? What's so crazy about it? What's so abnormal about this stack versus every other large-scale system on the planet, buddy? Come on, give Wait. it to me. All right. So first off, amazing. Know. Wow, Wait. you're a jackass. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. All right. No, no, no. I got, I got no credibility here, buddy. I got okay. no idea. Hey, let's, let's, let's keep, first, let's, first let's, off, let's first let's off, let's, 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 let's keep my space civil. Here, you know, like we well, removed him from good. from speakers. Uh, good. Elon, Elon, what a moron. Um, can, can I go into it? Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the biggest problems is that you can't run Twitter locally. Uh, so when I was at Facebook, you could run all of Facebook on a laptop. Um, there is no way to run Facebook uh, to run Twitter outside of a very bespoke configuration in a data center, and it makes it nearly impossible to build anything new on it. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's 20 million lines of Scala. That, like, think about that. That's insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the, the 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 thing that uh, have you did you post that that diagram? Of, no, uh, okay. I, I didn't post the diagram. But the the joke of the diagram isn't that there's that many pieces. It's that when people think of a microservice, they think of two hundred lines of code, not two hundred thousand. Yes, and it's two hundred thousand <laughs> for most of them. It, it, it it should be trivial to do something like add view count. It should be like. Like, like literally another sort of lion in a, in a, in a database. So like, it, it should be trivial, but it's not trivial because of the, the insane complexity of the Twitter software stack. View, um, I disagree about view count. I think view count is actually inherently a hard feature. But for example, right now there's a service that runs uh, a model and there's a service that calls that, like there's a RPC to run a model basically. Um, at comma, it's one line if you want to put the model inside the process. At Twitter, it's two weeks of the best engineer's time, right? That's something that should actually be one line. I disagree that view counts should be easy, even on the best stack in the world. But there are some things that are the, the, the likes feature that I wanted to ship and search should have been five lines. Yeah, I, I know. I, well, so I, I think if, if you we we do we do count view counts we just batch them so if if you reduce the requirement on view count to say like look we don't care about the view count being real time it's okay that it be every 100 seconds instead of every 1 second you reduce the the load by two orders of magnitude um obviously well the, mm, sort of um, yes this yes. Is, you, so, you, 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 you definitely reduce the load two orders of magnitude for tweets that are viewed all the time, right? But for tweets that are viewed every 200 seconds, it's the same load. Um, it, it's, if you're basically saying you're going to read every tweet from the table to get the views every 100 seconds, that's a lot of reads. Look, it's, it's, the point I'm trying to make here is view count is already counted. Like it, it's, it's already a thing that is happening. Um, but view count currently, the, the issue uh, is that it's going to Google Cloud. Instead of the on-prem stuff, the, the view count is, is making a call uh, to, to Google Cloud in batches uh, at, at a rate that is towards the magnitude uh, slower than what is needed to render it uh, with the current pipe. Yes. That's, that's, the, that's the actual issue. So, but, but if you then say, okay, look, we don't care about it being real time because it's something like a like is being updated about every second or so. Um, but if we say on like, your tweets, yes, on most people's tweets, no, no, I'm just saying like, like the update frequency is, is it's, it's near real time. Um, so, uh, but, but the point I'm trying to make is like view counts are already counted. Um, they're just being batched um, and being sent over a slow pipe. Uh, to an analytics uh, pro, uh, P, uh, software on on Google Cloud. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it, whereas the, the 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 likes are 
using the on-prem database. Um, and but, but you could it, 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 that's like an arbitrary decision. It could use the on-prem database as well. Yes. Um, so uh, if if it had not been an an, an arbitrary decision to uh, go off-prem to Google Cloud, then uh, it we, it would be uh, trivial to uh, add likes. It would be uh, considerably uh, easier. It, it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be onerous to add views. Um, so. If uh, if, especially if, you, if you're not like too precise about exactly how many views uh, there were, if you like, let it be a little, let it float a little bit, and, and you occasionally drop a view count. That so it's it's because like we're not like trying to balance a, a bank book here. Then then I think views actually like should, would be relatively easy. Um, so if views were in the same database as likes, yes, it would be easy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, and sure. it should be. Uh, it's it's absurd that 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 views are on on a in a, in a totally different database in Google Cloud instead of the on-prem, uh, you know, system. So um, anyway, that that's that's sort of a, a unnecessary complexity. I mean, the, the the Twitter stack right now is 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 like basically combining the difficulties of three different worlds, which is running um, a a complex real-time on-prem uh, database that's in three data centers. Uh, in Atlanta, uh, um, uh, one year uh, in, in Oregon, and one in Sacramento. Um, and Sacramento is like possibly the l worst place to have a data center because it's hot. And then like the summer, the, it, it got so hot that the data center failed because um, the HVAC didn't work. But then in addition to that, you've got uh, also using AWS, so using Amazon, and using Google Cloud. So all three... Um, are required uh, to operate uh, Twitter. Fleets. Uh, Fleets uses AWS. They built all the fleets in AWS. Yeah. I, so, I, read, I read the Google Docs for why, too. Basically, for what? For, for why they put fleets in AWS. Oh, wow. Basically, they couldn't yeah. get enough provisioning for the internal data centers. Yeah. I mean, um, like Sam Pilar was has been helping out, and uh, like I think Sam was saying, there was like some pretty nutty amount of data storage uh, is it actually um, analytics for app versions that don't exist anymore. Yeah, like it, I think it was like fifteen percent, maybe twenty percent. It's like was literally logging data from apps that don't exist. And that's what you know. This is like okay, that's wow. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. Um, 25 per, 25% of the CPUs are running the ads prediction model. It's the tiniest model. Those CPUs, only 30% is actually running the model. 70% is serializing and deserializing the data into four different formats. Yeah. And, and here's the crazy thing, So, uh, which is like really kind of mind-blowing to think about it. Uh, but it, it's, it, it took me a few weeks to actually even wrap my, my, wrap my head around it. Um, the uh, G Google, or so I should say, Twitter's advertising is, is actually, um, for the most part, irrelevance op optimizing. And so it's like, wait a second, like, what do you mean irrelevance opt optimizing? Well, when I ask people who have used Twitter for a while, it's like, how many things have you bought on Twitter? The answer is usually nothing. Um, but it's like, well, how many things did you buy on Instagram? Oh, I bought some a whole bunch of stuff last week. It's like, well, don't you think it's interesting that you wouldn't have accidentally bought something on Twitter after all this time? And like, the reason you haven't is because the ads are maximizing irrelevance. I feel like I'm stuck in a Douglas Adams novel. Um, it's, it's like like the, the spaceship was powered by maximum improbability. So... Uh, and, and so, so like, well, well, you're like, wait a second. Why on earth would you maximize irrelevance? Well, because the the team was told to maximize the impression, the number of advertising impressions. So, what happens if you try to maximize advertising impressions? Well, you actually are going to maximize irrelevance because if you if, if somebody is spending five minutes on Twitter and two of those five minutes are spent clicking on an ad, you've now lost forty percent of your impressions. Like head exploding emoji. Yeah. Um, dwell time is probably a much better signal for ads uh, than impressions. Um, I mean, this is what makes TikTok, what makes TikTok 
what makes TikTok so good? They, they have dwell time on all the videos. The time you spend on an ad is probably better than whether you are yeah, saw the ad or not. Though I somewhat disagree in the limit. If you had an ideal ML model trying to maximize impressions, uh, I think you'd end up with someone who just scrolls Twitter and looks at the ads all day. Uh, look, I'm just saying that like I, 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 when I was going through this with some of the engineers a few weeks ago, it took me a moment. I, 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 I just, I, it, it was... It, it was so insane that I I, I I couldn't comprehend it. It took me a while to under, actually understand that that because I was saying that, like no we we we, need, we want people to click on the ads. That's the whole point of having an ad is so that you might buy something. That's the reason for advertising. And so you know an ad that is highly relevant is content. An ad that is irrelevant is spam. Um, so we want ads that are as relevant to people's needs as possible um and and yet i see many ads that in fact most ads are are not relevant and when i ask people what are the con concerns about twitter is like well twitter keeps showing me the same ad that i don't care about all the time i'm like well that seems crazy but th then i f found the reason which is that they were being asked to maximize impressions instead of um you know maximizing actual uh, clicks and, and buying things, which is what they should be doing. When you run an ad campaign on Twitter, you can choose, I think. Uh, I'm not really sure what the back end does. I heard the back end tries to maximize money, but you can choose whether you want to run an impressions campaign or whether you want to run a clicks campaign. Uh, yes. No, no, re, re, the, the things have changed recently. So we have, uh, in the, like, you know, basically since the acquisition, I was like, no, guys, we need to maximize relevance. Um, and there actually has been good work in the direction of of relevance optimization. Um, so, uh, which you know, so that there, ha you know, this is, I don't mean to be sort of all negative here, but there's a lot of um, you know, there there has been good work recently in the direction of of actually having ads that are relevant. If you have for questions on this, I'm super nerdy about ad tech stuff. I'm super curious how Twitter could compete with like Google and Facebook just in terms of their identity network and how well they have like bucketed groups of interest to target. Like how does Twitter compete? Um, actually, I think uh, Twitter can actually do um, arguably better um, for someone that has used Twitter for some period of time. So if you have used Twitter for, let's say, I don't know, a few weeks, I mean, if you have like you're several hours in, and it's it's the, the the signal, the amount of signal that you have is high. You know what people, what 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 topics people followed, what 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 accounts people followed, what they liked, uh, what they you can say, you know, uh, certainly view count. There's the, the, and 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 a bunch of the stuff is actually used at Twitter for recommended tweets, what is called sometimes the, the home timeline. Uh, you know, uh, if, if you like, there's like a little stars icon in the upper right of the Twitter interface, and it'll say like for you or latest. So for you is recommended tweets. Um, a lot of people don't, actually don't even realize that the upper right stars icon is a way that you can switch between uh, uh, recommended tweets and, and accounts that you actually follow. I bet a lot of people on this call currently do not know that that, that is uh, what that stars icon does. Um, so, uh, the, 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 but the recommended tweets are actually pretty good. Um, home, so, home ML, yeah. Home ML is much better than ads ML. Home ML is using much larger models, many more features. The ads ML is very rudimentary. Yes, but but essentially, the, the, they should be going through the same pipeline. Yeah. So. They're, they're, it, like if, if 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 Twitter can accurately recommend tweets to you that you don't uh, explicitly follow, it can it can by the same token also uh, show ads that are relevant to you. But so they, the way that a lot of platforms do ad sales and a lot of like purchasers expect ads isn't necessarily. I'm going to give you these ads and I trust you to serve them to the right people. It's usually almost the opposite, where it's I want to target this group of people in this region who went to a Jiffy loop in the last 72 days, that level of micro targeting is something a lot of ad buyers now expect. And 
like it's a huge part of how CPMs can get so high on platforms like YouTube. Regardless of whether they're targeted or not, if your goal is CPMs, you should have a very good idea that someone's going to click on an ad before you show it to them. And you can do this with good ML. Listen, but sometimes I, I've these actually, advertisers will serve entirely different versions of uh, the same ad listen, to different can you turn this guy off, please? He's just talking nonsense. Thanks. Um, so uh, the, the, I've actually talked to the advertisers. Um, I talked to some major advertisers just today, this morning, and they were looking for, as you would expect, a return on investment. So that if they spend a certain amount of money, uh, are they going to get a return in excess of the amount of money spent? Quite rational not arbitrary or random. So, uh, and I won't say who it is, but there are a major advertiser who spent $60 million on Twitter this year. And they were like, uh, we calculated the ROI. Actually, like another company helped them calculate the ROI. And Twitter was the lowest. And this is why they're having difficulty uh, spending additional money on Twitter because they're literally looking at the lowest ROI. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, that's quite sensible. Um, and they were, they were like, well, you know, um, when this particular product is discussed in the, in replies, wouldn't it make sense to at at that point provide an ad that perhaps since you are discussing this product, perhaps you would like to buy it? I'm like, yes, that would make total sense. We should of course do that. Okay. They were like, yeah, that would be awesome. If you do that, then we would be glad to spend more advertising money. So, Meaning that they were, they were very rational and not arbitrary and random. I'll, I'll, I'll stand up for, for, for Theo worked at uh, Twitch. Uh, he's provided some good stuff on this space so far. Um, while in the limit, I agree with you, it would require retraining advertisers. And I'm not saying you can't do it, but advertisers have come to expect a lot of this micro-targeting stuff. Facebook pioneered a lot of it. Yeah, look, I, I, I think at the end of the day, if you can, if you can say like, if you can make a clear equivalence, or like, or like just say like, for if you spend amount X, to generate profit Y, provided Y is greater than X, you should continue. And provided, if, if you've got good analytics that demonstrate that, wherever the advertiser is, um, you, you will succeed. And that is not currently the case for Twitter, but it will be. Do you want to fight every battle or do you want to like, like, I mean, is this the battle Twitter should be fighting? Or should we just provide the most standard boring ads interface and just make it good like Instagram's? Instagram has an excellent advertising uh, interface. As as it's just literally talk to anyone, and they probably if they're using Instagram at all, they probably bought something last week. I, I bought stuff off Instagram ads. Yeah, Facebook has GPUs in the data center too. They're running decent sized models on people. Yeah, it's it's. I don't think we're trying to split the atom here. You know, um, we're just literally trying to show people ads that, for something they might actually want to buy. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're, 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 this is not the Manhattan Project, even though the database weirdly is called Manhattan. Um, so, uh, so it's just, I'm just, this is common sense stuff. Um, so, uh, like, yeah, like I said, I don't think this is a monumentally difficult to implement. It, it, it will get implemented and it will get done fast. Elon, would it be possible to offer like a more expensive $100 a month version with zero advertisements? I mean, 1% of people might be willing to pay that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a no-brainer. It's, it's, this is just a question of, com of what complexity do we add when. Okay. Um, so, like, it's difficult to, frankly, it's difficult to overstate the difficulty of adding stuff to, the, the adding features. Uh, features that should be easy to add are not easy to add because the, 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 the stack complexity is extremely complex it's it's, it's um so can we do refactors for my god months? uh so it, it, we've, we've made some simplifications even in the last uh, few weeks but th this is um it it it, it 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 will explode your mind uh to go through the entire stack it's it's like wow well um, but you you have to sort of make a trade-off between between features and refactor right like if you have x amount of engineering team you can decide how you want to allocate that yeah i mean basically we're, we're going to make uh you know a series of i think significant short-term product improvements um but then uh i think we'll we'll need we'll need to rewrite um most if, if in order to have a high velocity of improvement. I, I unfortunately, I think it's a it's a, a, a rewrite is is needed. Like, um, 
like if you say like look back at at uh, old school Apple, you know, I, when they had the their old operating system, and then Jobs came along with OS, uh, you know, OS X, you know, it was it was a it was a new stack. It wasn't like uh, <coughs> let's let's like you know fool well, around with the old Apple OS. Uh, it was like the, it, he just took the next OS and um, adapted that to Apple and said, yeah, your old software just doesn't work anymore. Too bad. But an operating system doesn't run at scale. Like this is doable, but it be I think it'd be pretty hard to do with continuity. Uh, to roll out this new stack promising no downtime um, on a clean rewrite seems very, very hard. Yeah. Um, nonetheless, I think that's what will be needed long term. Okay. Uh, I actually have a question about the stack. Sure. Uh, so you you uh, you brought up the twenty million lines of Scala before, and uh, uh, you mentioned that the microservices have a lot of the complexity of the Twitter system. Uh, so I think microservices to uh, like I believe microservices for complexity, like a system at that scale, won't really. Services land. Sorry, you're you're breaking up. Now, uh, you you think microservice yes or microservice? No, I'm no. fine with the microservices. My concern is the infrastructure or the the tech stack that you guys are using, because uh, instead of like using commercial or open source or like any standardized products, you guys have like inbuilt or like in-house. Uh, your own like implementations of everything. Like sure, you're using Kafka, but your RPC layer is Thrift, which is like developed internally. <laughs> your database is Manhattan. Wait, 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 wait. Thrift is a Facebook product. Which one? <laughs> Thrift is a Facebook product. The, the, my point is that uh, we, we 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 got we got the TFE, we got the GraphQL, we got the product fixer, we got the Ranker, uh, yep. we got the Manhattan database, we got the the, the Strato, we got the TweePy, we got the Gizmo Duck, we got the Twitter Memcache. And then wait wait till, wait till you find <laughs> out they're all want. built on top of <laughs> Panatra and Finagle, which are entirely custom Twitter open source Scala projects. Yeah, I get that. Oh, my and... my point is that if you have all of this custom and not like super standardized products. When eighty percent of your workforce happens to leave, now how how much more difficult is it for new new people or like even existing people to work with that infrastructure and be able to be able to iterate on it, much less like refactor it? I mean, uh, I think I could do it, but I think it would take me six months. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, hilarious. Um, so, uh, George, you mentioned that at Facebook, everything could run locally. Um, I've worked at companies where we had a dedicated team just for developer experience. Uh, and their job was like literally to dockerize and containerize everything and just make the app run. Uh, so people that can code can code. Um, and it just sounds like Twitter's lacking that. Yeah, you want to hire those people for Twitter? I think Twitter's definitely lacking that. So, yeah. I mean... <laughs> Elon, how far how far are you guys away from having a an engineer like a new engineer on day one? Just you know, walk in, go through a quick orientation, and then get a de like a single dev instance running, and just being able to submit a PR on, on the same day or maybe the same. Week. A dev instance? No, Twitter doesn't believe in that. We have prod, and sometimes <laughs> um, or a local, any kind of local. It, it is local. <laughs> no, no, this it's 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 I I, mean, I think to your point it it it. it it takes a while. Um, there's so much custom stuff that just understanding where everything is and how it all connects, uh, I think, is a matter. It, it, it takes at least a few weeks. Um, so I, th I think it is, would be difficult to be productive, you know, it, without at least a month of intense effort. I mean, that yeah, and and that would be like you're really good at software. If you, if, I'd say if if you can do something useful in a month. I think I understand most of it, but I think a lot of the problems are not a question of understanding. I think they're of just toolings and workflows. Um, the, the fact that I can't stand up Twitter anywhere except for the data center. For example, some services, when you develop them, you have to, they pack. It's a 1.6 gigabyte binary. It has to upload to the data center. That takes 20 minutes. And then you unpack it, and then, okay, 30 minutes later, you've tested your one-line change, and, oh, you made a typo. 
Yeah, it, it's it's it, 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 it. I'm just saying, like, like it's basically to to George's point, uh, which is a good point, is that the 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 the. the there's there's so much complexity and so much interaction across so many different levels that to to make progress is very difficult. Progress is being made, but it is very difficult to make progress. Um, when you touch like one element of the system, it affects like seventeen other elements. Um, so you know, like one one argument in favor of say a, a whole bunch of microservices is if they are truly independent, you can add additional microservices without affecting the rest of the system. But that is not the case of Twitter. Um, you, you, you know, like, like I said, we have this challenge of trying to add view count to tweets, which I think is really gonna make the site pop um, because we'll see just how, how many people actually view your tweets. Um, like this is, this, is, this is completely normal for video. So if, if you look at even a video on Twitter, it will actually show you how many views the video has gotten. And that gives you some indication of of the popularity of the video, how interested are people in the video? So if Twitter has views for videos, but does not have views for tweet for for tweets. So you you can tweet something and think, man, did anyone eat? What was did it? Was it like a a tweet fell in the forest and nobody heard it? Did anyone see my tweet? Actually, lots of people saw your tweet, but you don't know because they didn't want to um, put themselves out there by by actually liking it or retweeting or replying. So the the site will pop in a big way just showing view count of tweets. And people realize, holy smoke, a lot of people actually seeing my tweet. That's cool. Um, and then like I said earlier, we, we need to add functionality where you can like a tweet without it becoming, without advertising the fact that you liked it to the world or being able to say that maybe you didn't like it in a, I love that, that, that thing happened, like the like earthquake example. You don't love earthquakes, but it's noteworthy. Um, certainly, um, and it's, it, it, but it's putting a heart next to an earthquake, uh, that's weird. So um, you want to have more um, fidelity in how you, 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 what you think of a tweet, and, and you want to have the option of making that, uh, how you feel about that tweet, public or not public. Um, that's like pretty obvious stuff. But, but making those changes to the existing Twitter system is very difficult. Um, why, so, yeah. why not refactor and make the changes later? Why, why do they need to be done now? I think we need to make some improvement uh, in the near term. Um, and I think we can make some improvement in the near term. Um, so I, I looked at, I ran get log this morning and I looked at how many commits are going into the code base and what they actually are. Huge green diffs. For, for view count or for something else? All sorts of things. Uh, uh, maybe ten percent of them are view count related. Okay. Um, but all of these other ones are still they're still green diffs. There are a lot of people writing a lot of code. Um, today, uh, timeline mixer was quote unquote deprecated for home mixer. Great, yeah. great. it's deprecated for home mixer. Was yeah. Time, was, time, was timeline mixer deleted? Oh no! Now we have both timeline mixer and home mixer. They're running simultaneously. Yes. Um, well, it doesn't. It's not very meaningful to deprecate something if it's still running. Obviously. Yeah, exactly what I'm saying. Right. Nothing gets actually deprecated to Twitter. So Twitter has three APIs, and you can find this on public Twitter. If you go to Chrome Inspector, Twitter has yeah. a 1.1 API, a 2.0 API, a GraphQL API. It also has 1.1 Developer and 2.0 Developer. It has okay. five APIs that I could find. And then there's other ones people have talked about too that I don't know how to find because I don't have Android emulator on my computer. This stuff needs to be cleaned up and no one's doing it. Isn't it? It's, Agreed. it's pretty common. Hey guys, you mind if I ask a question? Sure. Y yeah, so I just wanted to know, um, Elon, so obviously as you know, I think with the, the Tesla you know, and, and what you guys do on the autopilot, you guys are recreating and redoing a lot of the code. And it sounds like with Twitter, um, it sounds like it's kind of a nightmare. So how are you prioritizing what you fix, what you're going to implement, like the views? How are you stack ranking everything, especially if things are taking a, a lot of extra time to, to get done? Um, well, bear in mind, like, you know, uh, the acquisition only closed like whatever, like six weeks ago, five ish. 
So this is probably like the, the biggest amount of change that has happened in an acquisition, possibly in history. Um, you know, we're at a little over 2,000 people. We were at close to 8,000 people. The site is still running, as evidenced by us being on it. Um, so, you know, th this is reasonably good progress. But the most essential thing to be done at, at Twitter was to uh, cut the burn rate so that uh, Twitter does not just go bankrupt next year. Um, that was like the, you know, task number one. Um, and there's still work to do on that front, but it's mostly done. Um, then there's also, it's, it's also important to move the revenue base from being uh, essentially entirely uh, advertiser, uh, de dependent on advertisers, and not just dependent on advertisers, but dependent on fuzzy brand advertising as opposed to advertising that, that has a clear ROI. Um, and as we're heading into what appears to be a recession, um, the first thing that uh, companies will cut is discretionary brand advertising. Um, so it is important for Twitter to therefore have a subscriber base. This is the reason for the Twitter Verified. Um, the, the reason we're, at, we're able to make progress with the Twitter Verified is because it, it makes use of, of a product that sort of was pre-existing, but not very useful, called Twitter Blue. Um, so being able to move to a so have subscriber revenue be a meaningful part of Twitter revenue is going to be essential for the prosperity, um, the survival of, of Twitter. Um, so that's that's why that that was that, that's actually the number one priority is is getting the Twitter verified to work and then also getting Twitter um, verification for businesses. Uh, and, and organizations to work so that um, you're starting to see that roll out now where an organization can actually identify who belongs to that organization. So like who is actually an employee, what, which accounts are actually belong to Disney and can, and can speak on behalf of Disney or on behalf of say Stanford or, or any organization. Uh, like if someone says they're affiliated with an organization, well, how do you know that besides them saying it in their bio? Well, we're now linking that on the back end so that uh, someone, so that organizations can say yes, these these Twitter handles actually do belong to the company, um, and are, are authenticated, um, and and this is also you know obviously an avenue for uh, you know business revenue, business business revenue. So the the, the, the subscriber revenue and, and sort of back end business revenue is is really important uh, as we see a rapid decline in brand advertising. These are all features, and they're all at the expense of refactors. Yeah. No, I, I, they are. Um, okay. But well, thank I, you for acknowledging. I, I, I think we won't get to the refactor if we don't make these changes. Why? Because we used to be bankrupt. What's the runway? Um, could I could I jump in with a, a quick question <laughs> to cut the the runway silence there? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, I feel like uh, you know, Elon, you're you're our philosopher king. Um, you know, Plato would be very proud of you. You know, you're you're you know extremely technically competent, and you know you you I think really understand uh, you know how to how to drive things in a in a good direction. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I really love how you're also leaning into the voice of the people and letting, you know, them have a say as well. But, uh, you know, you can't have a, a, a million backseat drivers. So I guess my, my question to you is how, how do you integrate the voice of the people when there are a lot of people that just don't have the, the right information to make decisions? Um, and how do you create the right governance systems to really find the signal from all of the noise to get, you know, Twitter to become something more like a republic rather than a, a dictatorship? <laughs> you know, um, curious what you think. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, in the, in the relatively near term, like these things are all kind of moot um, if if Twitter is organizing into the ground financially. So um, I was thinking about the runway question. Like, just to sort of, 
you know, give people some perspective here. Twitter was tracking to spend about five billion dollars next year. Um, we needed the trip to Disneyland. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, then, the, in the, 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 because of the nature of this transaction, uh, where there's twelve and a half billion dollars of debt and the Fed rate has been going crazy, um, there's on the order of a billion and a half ish of debt servicing that's required. So we're talking about like uh, net cash outflow. If you didn't make any changes of on the order of like six, six and a half billion next year with uh, revenue probably tracking to three. So that's like a negative cash flow situation of $3 billion a year. Not good. Uh, since Twitter has 1 billion in cash. So that's why I spent the last five weeks cutting costs like crazy. I think we also got to get the advertisers. What, yeah. What, yeah. Uh, we do need to get the advertisers. Um, but the, like I said, I, I've, I've spoken to a number of the advertisers. Their, 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 their requests are not uh, fuzzy or, or irrational or, or anything. They're like quite reasonable. They're like, just show us an ROI that makes sense. And I'm like, yes, I agree. If I were in their position, I would also want an ROI that makes sense, especially when when headed into uh, difficult economic times where these questions are asked a lot more than in prosperous times. In prosperous times, there is plenty of budget for advertising um, and you can, you can get away with uh, unclear ROI. But when times are tough, then then the hard questions of return on investment are asked. Um, and when you do not have a clear answer, then advertisers don't want to advertise because they're being sane. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the main issue. Um, so uh, this is important. So now th with the, the changes that we're making here on uh, massively reducing the burn rate um, and uh, building subscriber revenue. I now think that Twitter will, in fact, be okay next year. Um, I think we will be about, uh, hopefully, sort of roughly cash flow break even. That's what I expect for next year. Um, but this this will be quite this will be difficult. But but I think that's that's where what will happen is roughly cash flow break even, as opposed to minus three billion ish uh, on on worth one billion of cash, which would be therefore dead. Um, so that's, uh, the reason for my actions. They, they may seem sometimes, uh, spurious or, uh, odd or whatever. Uh, it's because this is not, we have an emergency fire drill in our hands. That's the reason. Not because, uh, I am like naturally capricious or, or at least aspirationally, I'm not naturally capricious. Um, so, uh, but but if if you sort of if you say you're looking at it from my standpoint and you're saying okay wow um, this company is is like like basically you're in a plane that is headed towards the ground at high speed uh, with the engines on fire and the controls don't work. I that's, use I, I use yeah. I use the same analogy at Kama. Um, can we afford good food? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it, um, it's, it's really important to me. No, I think we, we can afford good food. Um, the, 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 like the, the, the madness of the, for example, the uh, headquarters uh, food budget was that it was $13 million a year of fixed rate, no matter how many people showed up. So uh, if the normal meal price would have been, if the building was fully occupied, $20, for actually a quite a good lunch, the the, the food was good. Um, uh, then, but if you if you are, if you drop to five percent occupancy, you've now multiplied the effective meal cost by twenty, and that's where you get a four hundred dollar lunch, literally. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the the food was great. I loved the chia seed pudding and the smoothies in the morning. But yeah, you got to tell everyone to come into the office. It's crazy to me that people think they can have a job where they don't show up to an office. Right. And, and like, it seems like a logical thing. If, um, if you have a building where there's literally 5% occupancy, um, that you would seek to, uh, renegotiate the, the food budget and not, um, you know, have it be 20 times more than it should be. 
but that was literally the case. Um, so I, I, you know, um, the food's a lot worse now than it was a lot worse. Yeah. Well, we can definitely improve that. Uh, so that's, uh, this is not, that's not like a, I think some impossible thing to overcome. Um, so (laughs) we don't have to have terrible food. This is not, uh, you know. This is, it's not going to break the bank. The, the, the issue is more, we, we, you can't pay like $13 million a, a year uh, for a, a mostly empty building uh, for lunch. And not even including dinner. So I could, save, I could save $13 million by switching ads prediction from TF serving to Onyx runtime alone. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm saying we can totally have a good lunch. Right. Um, this, we're, we're not in like lunch purgatory for the rest of the time. Uh, <laughs> Um, we, you know, uh, it, like we may have gone too far is what I'm saying. I admit we may have gone too far <laughs> in, in cost cutting love, uh, love. with Thank respect you. to the lunch that, that could be the case. Um, and, 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 and so we'll have to sort of, we may have overcorrected in that regard and we can fix it. Um, <laughs> this is not an insurmountable problem. Um, so, uh, yeah. Wait, all right, so, so I'm like, all right, refactors, food, how about free speech? Well, I mean, free speech, let me tell you that if somebody's got to pay the servers, okay? <laughs> so the speech has got to cost at least $8 uh, oh. because <laughs> otherwise, how do we pay the friggin' server bill? Um, you know, there's like a billion and a half ish, you know, of all in server related costs. Um, and, uh, you know, we're trying to get that lower, but it's a lot. It's like not trivial. Um, and, and a minimum, you know, like there's like so, so somebody's got to pay the bills. Um, so um, advertising for sure. But there's some degree of uh, subscriptions. Um, and then on the on the speech front, like my general philosophy on that is that we should uh, hew close to the law in any given country. Um, you know, so. Uh, yeah, Elon, that makes me so happy if that's actually what the policy is. I'm upset when I see Paul Graham get banned for mentioning Mastodon. Yeah, that was a mistake. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I think I think there's a far cry. You know, look, you can make arguments for, for Kanye West. You can make arguments for Elon Jeff, but you can't make an argument for Paul Graham. No, I agree. That was a mistake. Okay. Can people post Mastodon now? Yeah, fucking post Mastodon all goddamn day long. I don't care. Yeah, because we're <laughs> going to build something way better than Mastodon, right? Like, come on, how hard could it be to beat these people? Uh, you know, uh, for, from an evolutionary standpoint, how'd that work out for the Mastodons? I don't know what a Mastodon was. <laughs> I still feel like there's something to be said about, uh, like, open source projects, though. You know, like, you have Linux that uh you know outcompeted windows um like uh you, you like big big networks of like armies of volunteers can maintain you know pretty complex things like yeah like sure it, maybe linux has run a little bit like a monarchy like george said earlier in the space but you know like i i, I do think that there's something to be said about open source software in general you know and it's it's like anti-fragility I mean, Linux is absolutely run like a monarchy, um, but Linux is not Twitter. Uh, Linux has a large code base because it needs to support many different device drivers and many different devices. Twitter needs to support basic core functionality. And I think open sourcing it, there's no value in the code, right? The operating system has value in the code. The value of Twitter is in the network. I suppose, but there's still like, uh, you know, composability arguments, right? Like, you guys could reuse and other people could build on top of if twitter if twitter was open source tomorrow what would you build uh <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. I, honestly i think we should just uh, just post the source somewhere i, I frankly I, that'd um, be sick <laughs> elon yeah. no one would ever get it to run well i i, I mean listen that that would that would let's just i think finally explain <laughs> do it <laughs> that is explained with words because you can just look at it um, oh, d- dump a car tarball twitter source it's 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 unbelievable so 
I have two ideas uh, I, I think that you I would should use. Just post it all, all 20 million lines of Scala, and you can just watch and, and read to your heart's content. Because, um, wow. I, I think it's actually um, more. <laughs> I think those are just the used lines. Of round numbers. Round numbers, you know. Yep, yep. Go take a million. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Well, that's just Scala. You know, we have a lot of Python as well. Yeah. But I actually... Um, that, that, there's a lot of a lot of <laughs> Mo most open source code quality is like really poor and on linux most of the contributors are paid by like intel and other big firms so it's not really a fair comparison at all yeah sure but, but yeah. you still have like composability though right like a lot of people can build on top of what they're building and then that makes like like i don't know is it, is yeah yeah i mean no. that's absolutely true but who's gonna sponsor it and no one's gonna sponsor <laughs> open source engineers Unless, and you know, composability is not like inherent to open hired. source. Composability is a thing that takes a lot of effort and money and time as well. Like, there's a lot of code bases that are open source that aren't composable at all. The theoretical potential is there, but it's not like a thing yeah. almost always. No, no one is going to volunteer to your open source project to come in and do meaningful refactors that reduce the code. They're going to write a feature, be like, "Please merge it so I don't have to maintain it," and then. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Um. Still the open hey, I, have a, I have a quick <laughs> idea, Elon. Is there any way to like gamify getting more people to use Twitter? Because I think a lot of people hear about Twitter in the news. They don't really understand how to use it or get the app and use it. But maybe if there's a way to encourage other people to show people how to use it, it could help get more daily active users eventually. Yeah. Um, well, so daily active users have been growing reasonably well, um, especially if you count real users and not like uh, bot bot sort of bots and trolls um so i mean like one of the super crazy things that i discovered you know, i was i only discovered this like basically about 10 days ago um was that twitter was being scammed um at the t to the tune of 60 million dollars a year for sms texts not counting uh north america so I'm like, what do you mean? As I was like, what do you mean? Like, there's sixty million dollars of, of SMS text. Yeah, Twitter is paying telcos. Basically, there are telcos who are not being super honest out there in other parts of the world, who were basically gaming the system and and running like two-factor authentication SMS text over and over again, and just creating a zillion bot accounts to literally run up the tab so that Twitter would SMS text them, and Twitter would just pay them millions of dollars. Wow. Without even asking about it, um, and and now this created some problems because I said, "Well, we got to stop that." And I said, "Like, you know, cut off any telco that's got fraud above ten percent." Now that uh, did cause some havoc in many parts of the world, um, and then people were like imputing like bad motives to it. But it was literally I just said to the team, "Hey, cut off any telco who's where the fraud's above ten percent." Um, that turned out to be a lot, <laughs> 390 telcos. <laughs> I'm like, damn, that's hot. Oh my gosh. Outside of North America, you know, so I'm like, okay, I didn't know there were that many telcos in existence, but it turns out there's some, you know, you, you, you get to like the fourth tier telco in Belarus, and you're like, you got some sketchy things going on. Um, but so, now, now you have people complaining that they can't log into Twitter because their SMS doesn't work. Yes. And so like now we're going back to the telcos and saying, listen, if you, if you stop scamming us, um, then we will gladly pay you some amount of money in SMS texts. But you can't turn a blind eye to relentless, bogus SMS texts. So then we're having that conversation with the telcos. And then we can turn them back on and say, listen, you just be reasonable. We'll, we'll take 10% of fraud. <laughs> it's fine. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to take 90% fraud. Um, so we're not going to spend $60 million a year on literally SMS texts outside of North America. Um, so, so, the, like, so a bunch of those users were, were just fake and and and, for, and and like literally for the purpose of running up Twitter's tab on SMS texts, um, kid you not, this is insane. Um, so now, um, but to your point of making Twitter easier to use, like the the the, the obvious okay. move I think is like if you if you load download the Twitter app or you go to Twitter, it should it should put you in, into the search page. Um, and, and immediately show you like what's trending. So it's like, mm -hmm. you, as opposed to saying, hey, you need to download the app, you need to install the app, you need to give us a username, you need to give us a friggin' phone number, and I'm like making it like an escape room 
to, to open mm-hmm. a Twitter account. It's like, let, let's, let's, we're going to give you a bunch of math puzzles, basically, to open a Twitter account. Um, and then once you're in the Twitter account, you're just sitting there with nothing to do. This is insane. Um, like, it, it, it really, it's not clear to me you should actually have a, a Twitter account at all unless you need to make a, a write action. It's like, unless you need to write something. So mm-hmm. if, you need to li- if you want to like or retweet or tweet or something mm-hmm. like that, okay, at that point, yes, you need an account. Then, then, then why did people put the pop-up back? They said you said they could do it. Which pop-up? The, the pop-up that I emailed you the first week that I wanted to remove. The one that when you scroll on Twitter when you're logged out. Uh, I didn't say we should put the uh, – okay, that's the miscommunication. Oh, great. Let's get rid of it again. right? Because I got yeah, rid of I it entirely. I got rid of it entirely. They added it back and they messed up adding it back so it wasn't dismissible. And then they fixed that five days later. But like they didn't mean to make it non-dismissible and it was non-dismissible. And I'd love to remove it altogether. Yeah, it's not clear to me why, unless there's some reason that I'm not aware of, uh, we should not be prohibiting just a a read-only scroll. I I know. There's no reason except that people are scared to lose, quote-unquote, MDAO. Uh, yeah, this, this optimization of MDAO is is like I, th- I think creating a bizarre incentive structure that doesn't make sense. It's endemic uh, in the organization. They love MDAO. Yeah, um, the, the, I mean the thing that that actually matters that is is like true user minutes, not like fake user minutes, but like this is, we're, we're confident this is a real user. We're confident this is um, this user actually spent time on the app, like, like as measured by like screen time on the phone, which is since the phone is the primary use case. Um, and then, and then to get like another layer deeper is what we said. The thing to optimize is unregretted user minutes. So I've heard like a lot of people say like, "Hey, I spent two hours on uh, TikTok, but I regret those two hours." I'm not saying I don't want to trash TikTok because it's quite compelling to a lot of people, but. Um, but I do often hear that they people regret the amount of time they spent spent on it. So I think the thing we'd want to optimize for is unregretted, true human user minutes. That's the thing to optimize for, not MDAO. Um, and and then with respect to advertising, as I said earlier, you want advertising that is as close to content as possible, where it's something, where it's a product or service that you want when you want it then it, that's actually useful. It, it's actually at that point becomes indistinguishable from content. Um, so these are the things to aim for. And uh, we're going to get rid of this uh, MDAO bullshit. And we're going to get, yeah, let's get rid of all the pop-ups. Let's get rid of when you click likes and quote tweets. Because fundamentally what these things are doing is they're lowering total minutes on the website. People see that pop-up and they click the X. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing to th- that... It, it is important to sort of have some authentication mechanism so people can't so you, you can't just create a hundred thousand uh you know instances of of uh you know virtual just can't create a hundred thousand virtual machines and like you know, just create and and have them all behave like like users although at this point with chat gpt you could probably just crush frankly because chat gpt would be would exceed i think the the yeah. Oh, it's it's about to be impossible. Capture is yeah. about to be impossible. I don't know what we're gonna do. Yeah, but I mean, like, at least we can try. At least we can make it like so. It's not trivial to have like a hundred thousand bot accounts, which it currently is. The the uh, best things the best things to do are like social proof kind of metrics. Um, sure. Gmail. Remember OG Gmail with the invites? Yeah, just, like, yeah, just follow the, you yeah. follow the tree. So if like if one the referral basis, and if, if one put if if there's one referral that goes. Uh, sideways, you just look at that. And you cut off that entire referral tree. That's how exactly. it worked yep. at the beginning. Hey, George, can I get two questions in or two thoughts? Yeah, what do you got? So, um, um, I'm in San Diego on my Starlink right now. So this is pretty awesome. Oh, cool. Um, I so I'm a father of four, and uh, I Elon, I have two ideas to help boost revenue. Um, okay. so my kids, they're going to be exposed to advertisements no matter what. Um. Could we have like a Twitter Nest feature where parents can like let their kids have accounts and the parents can control what advertisers their kids see? Because my kids are going to buy Robux or, you know, they're going to be buying stuff no matter what. And I'd I'd like to choose what they're exposed to. Refactors first. 
I agree with that as a software developer. Um, then the next thing is uh, there are tweets that I want to boost that are other people's tweets because I just, whether it's a political party or, you know, some move, so just, yeah. Um, could we see like a paper trail of where the money comes from? So going back to what uh, Pablo said, or I think it's a Pablo. Yeah, Pablo said earlier, how to see through the noise. I think it's a lot easier to see through the noise when we can see the paper trail of the money that is influencing the tweets. And I think that's what old... Uh, as an older user, I was frustrated with the bots and I'm fine with people paying to get things boosted, but I'd like to see where, what the source is, where it's coming from. That's it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Agreed. Um, uh, I did see you post a while back about video monetization. Is that a thing you're down to talk more on? Because I have a lot of thoughts after my time at Twitch. I mean, Twitter certainly needs to enable uh, longer videos. Um, the, I, I wasn't clear on, on what the limitation on, on uh, the Twitter on the Twitter video uh, length was, um, but I was recently told that it was a, a two gigabyte uh, file size limitation, at least in the current stack. So. Um, like it's difficult to have video monetization if the videos are like extremely short. Um, so, uh, but if you have a you know better codec than is currently used at, at Twitter and a resolution that is reasonable for a phone, um, you can have some pretty long videos in, in, in two gigabytes. Um, so, but like like to first approximation, I feel like the, the first the first the first order is is like you need to actually be able to post a sufficiently long video. If you cannot do that, then nothing else matters. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think most people have access to that. So when I did that live stream uh, before I joined Twitter, I had to get Media Studio, um, and I actually got this. My friend was like, "Oh yeah, I know a guy in a Telegram group," uh, and he PayPal'd him thirty bucks and got access to it. So that's what it takes to get access to long video on Twitter today. Yeah, well, it's my the, the, again. I have to like sort of pre a lot of things. I should say I should preface by this is like what I think someone told me, um, as opposed to like this is the God's honest truth. Um, so that's an important preface for anything I say. It what I say may not be true, or at least it's my recollection of what I think someone told me. So uh, don't take anything I say with a grain of salt. Um, but. Uh, Anyway, the, the if the if the two gigabyte th th thing is is real, then we can um, actually have long videos with an improved codec. The current codec, I think, is quite old, and uh, and and then uh, having a resolution that's manageable on a phone, um, not not super high def, especially if it's something like you know a podcast where where you don't need to like see every detail in in high res. Um, then then it's just like basic stuff like uh, you know having an an ad, a video ad attached that is at least you know re reasonably relevant to the uh, f the, the material. Um, you know, so if it's a video about technology, that the that the ad is you know a technology related ad. If it's a video about gardening, it's a gardening related ad. It's sort of stuff that would make sense. Um, like I said, not splitting the atom. It's pretty basic. Um, and the, you know that that that's what that's what needs to happen on that front. The main problem that we saw was getting good enough ad inventory for video ad. We found it was a lot harder to build up a large pile of ads to serve a distributed enough group of people, and it took a while for Twitch to even have bucketing of ads for users in the first place. I are you confident in the ability for Twitter to acquire video ad uh, buckets and uh, targets? No, I think that is a legitimate issue. Um, and actually, if, if I look at YouTube, because I actually watch YouTube without YouTube Premium, just to kind of see what kind of ads are being served here, and the I like I very often will see sort of nonsense ads that are like quite scammy and and, and irrelevant to the subject. So if you if YouTube is even having trouble getting ads that are relevant to the subject, then probably Twitter will have some challenges that are significant. Um, but I think part of this is also just like re reaching out proactively to uh, companies that do things in a particular arena 
and say, we have inventory that is relevant. Uh, why don't you try advertising on with, with, uh, you know, some, something that's in this genre and see how it goes. Um, and then, like I said, if you can, if you can actually have um, a logical return on investment for advertisers, they, I think on, you know, on mass, they will be logical. Um, you, you might have some irrational actors, but for the most part, they will be logical. So, um, yeah. Um, but I do think that the ad inventory thing is an important problem. If you only have ads of a particular type, then, you know, you, you're going to have trouble achieving relevancy because you simply lack an ad to, that is relevant. It also has to be a diverse enough set within that because video ads are much more frustrating as a user to have as repeat. So if you see the same video yeah. ad three times, it's significantly more frustrating than seeing the same uh, suggested tweet three I times. I feel like they're so bad everywhere. I feel like I get that all the time. Even like when I'm watching, like I have a cheap Hulu account with ads. That's the same ad three times. And I'm like, this is terrible. Yeah. Google's the only platform that's really nailed this. Uh, Instagram's doing better here because they're just, their ad platform is incredible nowadays. Like Meta's been killing it. But the inventory problem for a diverse set of video ads is really tough yeah doesn't a tiktok build a model per user and they spend something like 10 kilowatt hour like per year per user no um i might have spread some of that misinformation uh, no you can read tiktok's paper uh you can read it uh monolith it's pretty normal content recommendation engine stuff they just like do it well the the, the paper is, public. is it actually crazy to do that though no, and we're gonna start to see that. Um, like, I, I think that the look eventually you're gonna build the infinite jazz videotape. Eventually, you're going to build content that is so compelling that you'll find people just stare at this stuff for hours and hours and hours and hours. And you can you can do that as the ML gets better and better and better. But uh, you know, unregretted user minutes, right? Yeah, that's. I think that's the right thing to aim for. Um, like, I think it'd be hard to argue like, okay, we, we, we improved unregretted user minutes that what, that, that is definitely a good thing and not a bad thing. So anyway, I got, I got to, uh, throw in the towel here guys. Uh, but, um, I, I do want to sort of leave off saying that there are a lot of people at Twitter doing great work. Um, and it is uh, super appreciated. Um, so this is like, you know, definitely not meant to be like, let's trash uh, Twitter uh, nonstop. It's, it's like, you know, at, at least aspirationally meant to be self-critical um, and to say like, okay, what, what can we do to make things better? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just do want to make sure that uh, this, this does not come across as being unreasonably critical of the, those who are actually working hard to make Twitter better. Um, so uh, with that, I, I, good night, guys. Thanks, Appreciate Elon. Appreciate your time. Right. Very supportive. Thanks, Can't Elon. to see where Twitter 2.0 goes. Thanks, Elon. Hey, George, can I ask you a question about engineer numbers? Yeah. Originally, why I joined, I didn't think Elon was going to join. Well, I mean, um, e Elon joined. So after Elon joins, you know, he's like, he, 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 he's the only one who's allowed to say anything about Twitter. You know, I'm not. Like, I can't, sure. I can't, I'm not going to reveal how like Twitter stuff works. That's not an NDA. Exactly. Uh, so I'm, I'm a software engineer. I, similar situation of, I'm on a project where there's been a lot of turnover and the skeleton, skeleton crew. Um, I feel like I'm being pulled between like, I, I want to be doing software, but I also have to understand the business better too. And do you think that's like a bad position to be in when you, when you, as an engineer, you, you got to start trying to innovate let's, the business and let, let's, let's, let's bring this space back to, I mean, you know, Elon shows up, he'll, 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 uh, take any conversation in any direction he wants. Um, but yeah, let's bring this back to, you know, the question of the space, which That's is the tech. Com oh boy. scale, complexity, and, and, and number of engineers. Uh, no, look, this is, it's great to have Elon join. I'm, you know, it's, it's so nice to you think Mark Zuckerberg would show up in a space. And, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is not even the worst. You think Sundar Pichai would ever come talk informally about Google? You know, this is something right here. This is something I absolutely love about the new Twitter. 
like that. That, that YouTube he... actually does this, which is really cool. Huge shout out to her. Wait, YouTube does this? Who? Yep, the CEO of YouTube. I Susan Wojcicki believes her. Last Susan Wojcicki has like I don't know how to pronounce yeah. her last name. She has like Twitter Spaces where she just casually Not... talks about YouTube. Not Twitter spaces, but she hops into the conversation on Twitter in the replies all the time. And she shows up on like really like small people podcasts on people who are known for pushing back on the YouTube platform like regularly. Cool. She's been surprisingly transparent. Like I've been super Wait. impressed with the leadership of YouTube. Then why did we get rid of dislikes? Because of the the net uh, use of them was harmful enough that they decided it wasn't worth maintaining. It was a long battle internally. He has done oh. multiple interviews where she talks in depth about this with both Marquez Brownlee and with Ludwig. I appreciate that. You know, I haven't seen these interviews. I haven't looked. I've just complained about dislikes. So, look, I, I don't know. I'm personally, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of uh, transparency, building in public. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's cool to see. Hey, uh, George, was this space inspired by uh, John Carmack leaving Facebook? I mean, that's one of the things, too, right? Like, this is really not all about Twitter. Um, we, we can discuss John Carmack leaving Meta. Yeah, I mean, look at what he said, right? Like, you know. Yeah, something like 5% like, GPU usage. Oh, I feel like I can say absolutely anything I want because I don't work there and I have no NDAs in place with there. Yeah, I mean... You know, look, you know how much they spent on Horizon Worlds? And then have you actually used Horizon Worlds? Horizon Worlds is the most expensive video game in history. I've never heard of it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it's their metaverse thing. I've never, I've never actually used it. I've, I've only seen, seen videos of it. At this point, um, I'm convinced every social media company needs to, like, spend too much money to build a game at their peak. I watched the same thing happen at Twitch. They built a karaoke game. They tried to con or contract Harmonix to do it. They're like, wait, nope, the scope here is absurd. We're not doing that. And they hired a whole game dev team and I had to teach them React after when it was a disaster. Good times. Um, yeah, I, I think... You know, the metaverse could be so good but you need a John Carmack-like character driving it forward, right? Because otherwise you're going to end up with the same sort of blow you end up with at all these companies, and you know, it'll be terrible. Uh, we got some new speakers. Hey, George. Thanks, man. Hey, uh, I was impressed with the, uh, with the way everyone handled that uh, runway question. That, was, that really stuck out, and so I was curious... Just to like kind of download those n numbers real quick. So it sounded like he was saying three billion a year in cash burn was what he was expecting with like a billion in the bank. And I'm just trying to like track through all that because like I don't know if anybody knows, but I would imagine the payroll number previously was probably like 1.5 billion cut to like 0.5 or something like that. So I'm just trying to figure out. I have. Then I don't think he's supposed to talk. I don't think he wants to talk about Twitter stuff on this without. Oh, yeah, okay. no. Okay, I'll, my I'll, bad. Talk, to, I I'll talk to you that quickly. I apologize, George. I, I will. I will talk about that for a minute. Um, I mean, I did. I did actually really appreciate that Elon answered it. Uh, I. I again, I know nothing about this. Everything I know about Twitter's financials comes from public disclosures beforehand, and I'm not just saying that. I actually know nothing about it. Um, so you know that's. I believe what he said was Twitter's burn is three billion, and they have one billion in the bank, and that's not a long runway. It's like four months or something, right? Yeah. yeah totally. So again, things all are above my pay grade. I don't work at Twitter anymore. The, the, um, the, just the one thing I think to be aware of, and maybe to factor in, is just that I believe that the acquisition put a billion dollars of debt expense onto the company. And Elon did. Elon did say, that. "Yeah, that's correct." And so, like, I, I, I kind of pressed him in a previous space, and I, I actually really appreciated him engaging with me on it, just like you're saying. Um, yeah. And he, you know, he, I think, I think if I were to summarize sort of like his answer, I think he kind of feels like, well, Twitter was going to get run to the ground if he didn't buy it and stuff. And I, I don't know if everyone else agrees with that, but I think he kind of sort of insinuated that he was worth it for that billion a year of expenses. But that's like the equivalent of like probably like the entire company payroll now or something like that, like for one guy. So I was just like, I'm just trying to like wrap my head around it. Look, yeah, I mean, look, this is, I, <laughs> I can't really speak to that stuff. 
Uh, I know the runway of I know the runway of my startup, and it's considerably longer than uh, than four months. Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad to hear uh, that, you, and I appreciate you uh, having me on. And uh, thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll keep this going for another like five ten minutes. Uh, okay, so uh, if you can talk about Twitter's financials, uh, let's talk about the Twitter's uh, technology instead. I feel like I didn't really get to phrase my question correctly. Uh, when I asked it last time when Elon was up. So I'll try to phrase it again. Um, I think having all of this custom non-standards tech, tech stack, a lot of it, a lot of which is like invented in-house by Twitter employees, Twitter, empl- Twitter developers. Uh, doesn't that like slow down onboarding or working on new features significantly? Why not use gRPC that a million people out there know how to deal with? And uh, instead, using Thrift RPC, which is something that maybe five hundred or a thousand people in this world know. Thrift, Thrift is not at all. Uh, this is straight up engineering fact. Uh, Thrift was invented at Facebook. Uh, I used it while I was at Facebook. Thrift is not the problem. Um, and so, also, open source Twitter, you can find Finatra and Finagle. Um, so Finagle is a RPC server. Uh, Finatra is like a routing engine on top of it. Uh, Finagle can do both HTTP and Thrift. No, I know these are open heads up, That's George, not... People are pinning random shit in the like thing on top now. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Oh, I don't care. Just ignore it. Um, how do I? My I my that. point was not that it's not it's oh it's not open source. My you point is that how many people out there? The the yeah okay so you can say yeah there's a developer pipeline problem for a language like Scala again a technical debt is technical debt right I, I've never coded a line of Scala in my life and now you can watch my last two streams I did advent of code in Scala look am I a Sc- an expert Scala engineer not at all but can I make decent pull requests yeah I think now I can um I don't think that's the problem I think the problem is technical debt uh it's just Like technical debt can appear in any language, in any environment. And I think the largest, I mean, you know, I have have a neural network framework called TinyGrad. Um, It's a thousand lines. And well, it's a little more than a thousand lines, but the goal is to keep it at a thousand lines because lines are one of the only reliable proxies I know for technical debt. Uh, now, of course, you can game this, right? Any, anything, once it becomes an optimization target, it ceases to be a metric. This is true, but at the same time, you can only game it so far. Elon was saying 20 million lines of Scala. What's 20 million lines? You know, what, what on this website really should take 20 million lines? Might if I ask a question? Sure. Um, yeah, so I've worked on a lot of big tech companies, Amazon, Google. I worked at Google for like 10 years and a lot of teams. Um, and I also worked at a few startups. So like one thing I noticed is with the JVM languages like Scala, I've worked with a few teams that have used Scala is that, or just any JVM language, um, is that the, there's, there's this additive engineering problem. Like they keep adding code. It seems like the JVM languages in particular, um, whoever, and sometimes, you know, I think like. You know, the, the JVM languages, like, they inc- almost encourage, I feel like, code bloat and lines of code. And it's, like, no big deal. There's so many advanced tooling. There's so many the tooling around these languages is so good that they can yeah. just pump I... out. The IDEs can just pump out code. And then it gets to the point where it's not readable. It's optimized for writing, right, all the refactoring and stuff. So they're not optimized for reading because the tooling is so good, right? And so you end up with, like, tons of code. And then when people want to add features, they instead of reading the code that's already there, which is enormous, they just, like... They just write it again. It was yeah. like, yeah. Um, so I was gonna, I was gonna first say, like, why would the VM have anything to do with? Right, I can run Python on the JVM if I want. I can go get Jython. Um, so I don't think it's the JVM. It's mostly itself, the libraries. The libraries, like, on um, like, the, there's so many libraries and there's so much tooling that you end up with like enormous uh, amount of code. I, I think it you is. You keep tooling. like dancing around points I really agree with, but then the details are nonsense. Oh, it's like I largely agree with you here. I just I don't think any one of these things is the problem. It's not well, libraries. Just... It's not the JVM. But like, absolutely, Wait. we're at a point now where things like you can write much more code much more easily because the tools are getting better every day. I think we as like an engineering like community need to figure out how to deal with that reality where the average engineer isn't as talented because the bar for engineering has gotten so much lower because the tools are so much better. 
But I think what I mean, was saying earlier is kind of right, though, is that like every company just has all these bespoke different tools and all this like complex little like onboarding thing that takes, you know, like it, it probably takes a month for someone to ramp up into any. Of mm, not not Facebook. Not not. Yeah, yeah Facebook, Facebook killed it with their cuts. Would you agree? Facebook killed it. Exactly. How good? I, I, worked, I was full time at Facebook in, 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 in 2011. How good was Facebook's tech? I was genuinely surprised they had to do layoffs because they've been able to hire so lean compared to the amount of like product surface area they cover. It's nuts. Like they, the way they architect everything is incredible. These are the arguments I kept making inside Twitter. I'm like, guys, it, you know, and people are like, George, George has no idea what he's talking about. I'm like, I've seen Facebook. It's beautiful. Hey, uh, it's um, uh, CSH alum here from 0508. Um, long time, man. Um, uh, I, I was wondering if you would agree that with um, the direction AI is going, I just feel like I feel like with how much code is exists open source and accessible to AI, um, I feel like like code monkeying work of computer scientists and software engineers is going to just continue to get less and less, and it's going to start to become more of a who can communicate with the engine the best and the most creative uh, creatively. It already is if you think about it right so so programming unlike say truck driving is already tool complete uh so i mean to specifically talk about the the jvm thing it, it may very well be and you can like do this as a controlled experiment that like do ides like intellij which have all this autocomplete boilerplate yes. functionality i think it's actually intellij yeah i um, think it is i think you're right it's intellij yes. and it's going to get worse with chat gpt and all this code generation it's kind of we're, we're like it's it's not going to be good i i, I mean yeah i, I don't even think it it's, depends on your perspective worse right or, or better no the, the I, ai the ai code stuff is ridiculous AI, ai code generation is ridiculous and like it's it's just the, the whole thing is laughable and here's why um programming is tool complete meaning what happens, accounting is also tool complete. When you build better tools for accounting or programming, you end up with less accountants and less programmers having leverage to do more work, right? This is in contrast to something like Walmart cashiers or, uh, or truck drivers, right? No, no matter, the truck might get better, but you still need the driver to log the hours. All right, fine, you can say Walmart cashiers is a bad example because, you know, okay, now you have one person overseeing the four self-checkouts, and maybe that is the same thing with technology. Um, so let's stick with truck drivers, which is, like, not tool complete. But the AI code generation in of itself is, like, well, why do you need the extra step, right? What do you want the AI to do? Hey, George, and I think hey, that- George one, one question right on, on the topic I think that you are trying to address is, where are you at on in terms of how many employees or engineers are ultimately needed just to sort of get the job done or kind of have like a good healthy work life balance like that sort of thing like in terms of it. work 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 I I think I don't like work life balance I, I think work or whatever it is you want concept. yeah and, and the people yeah. there want no I, I don't think I don't I think work life balance is a stupid concept I, I think that you, you know work is life um, take that part out of the I question think... just you know kind of like. How many how many engineers do you need to do what? Right, it all depends on on what the task is, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to think through like sort of what's what's kind of the unifying vision that that's going to bring all the engineers at Twitter together. Like, I liked some of the feature points Elon made about like showing the views and how that would raise a lot of interest. I thought he had some like interesting ideas, but like, what's the sort of vision? And then like, what what support do you need? from you know whatever the powers that be are above you as teams to get the job i don't work you know at twitter for the folks at twitter i don't work at twitter i don't know anything about twitter uh i resigned from twitter today uh, i want to talk about ai for various reasons i'm certainly down to talk about ai and ai coding cool okay i misunderstood thank you Sure. If you're not, if you're a speaker right now and you're not speaking, please uh, step down and we'll let some new people join. Hey, George. If, 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 down, thanks. I'm sorry if I wasn't supposed to pin up top, but but um, I, 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 I pinned that little bit about the Amber Alerts. If an Amber Alert goes off in an area and it, a, a car happens to drive by a Tesla, what are the odds it doesn't? 
can the camera scan its license plate, make a model, and beam that instantly to authorities? And I, I figure this would be a really great application of Tesla. The fact that Tesla has cameras. Oh, who's, who's writing that? Oh, we got to write code. We got to test it. <laughs> Ask ChatGPT. Maybe ChatGPT can do the it. Reason why I, the reason why I even, I even float that idea, though, is because, of course, I, I think there's something bigger here that Elon might be playing at, right, is 5D chess, which is – he has all these cars mapping the roadways and and uh, noting the cars that are driving by him. So now that he has Twitter with phones with geolocation in other drivers' pockets, Honda Accord drivers, is he going to be able to pinpoint when the Honda Accord passes by the exact location of a Tesla? Again, again, how much? Hmm? You know what? Features are really easy to imagine until you have to write them, right? Until you actually ideas have to are so cheap. Ideas That's are true. so cheap until you have to like make these things sort of work at scale so you say like is this what someone's planning like it doesn't matter what someone's planning it matters like what's actually going to get built and yeah you know look you know any look i've been working at common now for six years you know like easy it sounds in theory to make maps from our data oh we have all the data oh, we know where all the lanes are we have such an accurate gps yeah good luck making maps productizing a good idea is the hardest part i agree but I do think that Tesla is particularly good at making awesome products, uh, unlike uh, Twitter was. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I think that, that you can do certain things with, with organization, but it really is a different product, right? It is a different product, and there are some challenges. I mean, Twitter is not perfectly horizontal scale, right? Um, Tesla is perfect, pretty much perfect horizontal scale. Not entirely perfect. or You know what? I'll say common. A comma is pretty much perfect horizontal scale. We have some things where all the cars connect to the server, but all the driving is done locally on the car. So that scales perfectly, you know, like there's no, there's no complexity to deal with there. If you make it work on one car, it's easy to make it work on all the cars. But if you make it work on one Twitter app, making it work on all the Twitter apps might be Not so easy, off. yeah. I, I think Elon kind of, brought up a, a really good solution though which is like just incentivize people to delete code like like refactoring and and deleting code and simplifying isn't sexy work and no one really wants to do it but i mean wait, 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 pay them more that, <laughs> for deleting code that is all i wanted to do with twitter that's all i wanted to do i was there to refactor and make it beautiful i don't know but you see the problem with refactoring and making it beautiful is you got to do that instead of features yeah, exactly. I guess just pay the people more who are refactoring. <laughs> no, it's not a question of paying the people more. It's a question of if you have 400 people dumping shit into a pool and 100 people shoveling shit out of the pool, the shit still becomes, you know, there's still so much shit in the pool. But at what point do you say fuck it and just build a new pool? Delete bounty. Just make a delete bounty. Well, and you know what? I mean... In, in this is one of those at remind me in five years kind of things. Remind me in five years and let's see. I'm so curious to see where Twitter will be and what their infrastructure will look like. Right. I mean, also I, that's essentially what ended up happening, right? Yeah, the timeline mixer was deprecated and the new rewrite of the home mixer was implemented. Did it work? Uh, well, did it work? What do you mean, did it work? There's now both of them. Yeah, yeah it increased the cost, but did it help the tech, tech debt? No, you're just saying you have more shit. There's more shit in the pool. You didn't take any shit out of the pool. <laughs> I, this is like a slight wrap back to a topic earlier around like efficiency and like the AI stuff. Yeah. I think that the problem we see in a lot of these larger companies, especially the ones that like do lots of different features, is how they transition from like, or. <sighs> I've noticed a pattern. I think there's a term for this, but the similar to the Moore's law where every two years processors get like twice as good every three years, any given piece of software becomes two to three times easier to write. And if your company has been around for 17 what? years, a lot of efficiency has been unlocked by us improving the tooling that George, you and I as younger guys, we look at these services and we're like, what the fuck? This could be like a hundred lines of code instead of 10 services that are thousands of lines of code. A lot of that is a shift in the industry based on all the tools that we use now every day. For me, AI is another one of those where certain languages and certain architectures that right now are inefficient to write because of the just raw amount of code 
for something like Golang, for example, where you're copy pasting half the code you write, something like AI, uh, specifically like Copilot, can make you much more efficient as a developer. I think what we're seeing is one of those two to three X moments in real time, but I don't think we're seeing developers die. I think we're seeing yet another advantage to the people who are willing to start from scratch and take advantage of the new way to build a pool. So with respect to Golang, I mean, that's a very deliberate choice on the language designers. It's like, you know, well, we have all these people and like, let's be honest, they're not smart enough to code C++, so we'll give them Golang. Um, and like, that's the real, that's the real justification for it. Um, you know, and I consider myself one of those people not smart enough to code C++, and that's why Golang is nice. But that verbosity, like, you know, the very explicit, painful error handling in Go, having to actually check each error code, it's there to encourage people to think, right? So you can go and pave over that with ChatGPT, but then you just get people who don't think. Right? And then the whole point is kind of ruined. Like Go was very deliberately designed that way. Um, I can't speak to how Java was designed because that was all before my time. But I remember when Go came out. I like watched all this happen. Well, is, is Co is, sorry, sorry if this is a, a Jason topic, but is, is, is Copilot's biggest um, or like barrier to adoption just installation, the, the intimidation of installation? And with the price of Copilot, would customers... Um, would they be price elastic enough to like pay an extra ninety nine bucks to have like an Uber like service used nearby? Copilot, I didn't find it great. It's the same thing with ChatGPT. Like I got multiple top one hundred in the world placements this year in Advent of Code using Copilot. Once you learn how to work with it as a tool, it's kind of oh. like Vim, where you have to learn to train it, like know how to write, name a variable, leave a comment, and trick it to writing the right code. But it's a tool in that way, like you have a relationship with it. And if you're trying to play Advent of Code, where uh, you kind of do it as fast as possible, sure. Copilot might help you. I also worked at Twitch for half a decade and run a company and wrote half the code for that too. It Wait, works in, really well no, in all these environments from my experience. You really, you, you find Copilot helps you because I don't. Yes, it's it, when it conflicts with other tools that I find as if not more helpful, like when it gets in the way of TypeScript's type definition autocomplete and stuff like that, it can get annoying. But I do often find it improves my velocity and experience as a developer when it hits it hits and if you know how it's going to miss and you'll learn quick when you use it right. i'm gonna have it write this algorithm i know it's gonna put th these two things in the wrong place i'm gonna delete this one and move this one somewhere else it makes me feel better as a developer the same way i did when i first got really into vim but it takes a bit to really like feel that so do you like autocomplete in general no yes what it's guided and you have a good type safe system that is defining the autocomplete. I'm really big on full stack type safety and autocomplete IntelliSense, like the Microsoft way where it guides you to the right line of code is something I'm really big on. I find, I, I hate autocomplete. Uh, I, I never use any autocomplete for anything. The things that I like with IntelliSense. The Maybe mobile texting, that's about it. What? Maybe mobile texting because it's so annoying to try to get the, you know, that's the only time I use autocomplete. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah, no, I have, for, this is, no, specifically for programming. Um, I like that I can right-click on a function and it takes me to the definition. Even if that's only correct 90% of the time or 80% of the time, it's still a lot better than, you know, having to uh, grep for it. Um, but I don't know. I, I find most auto I, to like... So I run a podcast where I talk about all of this type of stuff. I've had, like, the creator of React.js on. I'm going to have the creator of GraphQL on soon. If you're down, George, I'd love to have you on to show you how my uh, stack works and, like, how the T3 stack stuff goes, specifically because I think you'll see when you have full stack type safety implemented from your database to your user, autocomplete stops being a thing that annoys you and starts being a thing that guides you to writing the right code the first time. Always, it's right, so powerful when you have it set up right. Let's set it up. Let's uh, we'll set up. We'll set up a live stream, and we'll, uh, I will I will give this stuff a try. Look, it's the kind of thing also where I'm sure if I um, I don't know. I I, I have I, uh, like I don't really like tooling. I, I like absolutely minimal tooling. I, I used Vim for a long time with nothing, no plugins, no nothing, and now I use VS Code pretty much. The most bare bones you can make it, but um. So so so, so I'm, a, I'm a little embarrassed. I did not. I was using the I said copilot earlier. I meant to say open pilot. <laughs> um, we were just talking about copilot. I used the wrong word. Uh, when I was trying to ask, uh, uh, it's as if it was uh, with with open pilot was the um it, like with the with the cost of the system in general and if if installation is intimidating for it, it is like a barrier to entry for. 
adoption than like would uh, an increment of 99 extra dollars for like an uber like installation service for uh, yeah yeah you know what you were on that service you were on that service i'm bored thinking about it um <laughs> no, no really uh, no. so oh by the by the way by the way we are dropping now that i got i got 14k people here we are dropping an incredible video of the year uh production car comma three uh look i don't want to run a business i don't give a shit about any of that i want to solve self-driving cars i want to beat tesla and you hit a deadline <laughs> look at this where are you uh, posting that video george what's up where are you posting the video oh right here on twitter I mean, it's the best. Oh, it. Do you want any help with YouTube the YouTube too. strategy? I'm a I'm a big fan of helping with YouTube strategy stuff. I help a bunch of like Y Combinator companies. It's something that's just, like I'm nerdy about the YouTube algorithm and how to make it tick. So if you want to chat about that, I just had a video go viral about AI recently. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not that. It's not that good. I mean, I, I don't really care. Like, it, it's more of a like. A lot of things at Comma are. We we have a thing where it's like. I don't really care what people think of me. I mean, the perception is so meaningless, right? Like, let's actually just solve self-driving cars and let's build something that's 10x better. Uh, and then, like, I don't care what you think of me. It's just 10x better. Like, you have to use it. I'm sorry. Um, and we think of a lot of, like, the, 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 the programming stuff like that. Like, OpenPilot. OpenPilot. Their entire OpenPilot, which can drive a car with zero disengagements to Taco Bell, is smaller than most of Twitter's microservices. Well, Twitter might be a bad bar to compare with, but yeah, I get the point. That's incredible. Um, yeah, but you know, but it comes down to it's just the same number of engineers work on both, right? Wow. It's just, it's just, you know, it's just the thing that will determine how many lines of code your your thing will have is strictly a function of your number of engineers and a function of nothing else. And I think that kind of brings the space full circle. Does everyone kind of pretty much agree with that? You know, give or take. Why did Twitter need that many engineers? <laughs> I, I largely agree. I think that it, the way things were built when Twitter started and the way things are built now are different. And a lot of the chaos that we now see as obvious is like obvious in hindsight. Uh, very much agree. Yeah, I, I, I think that I know that whenever I'm writing something, the first time I write it, it's terrible. The second time I write it, it's like kind of okay. You can sort of see that it's going to be good. And then the third time I write it, it's actually good. Uh, I have one challenge for this now that I'm like really deep on the product side. Uh, the first version's often enough to figure out if you have product market fit. And it's often not worth me paying you as an engineer to build the second and third version until we know that the product has some market fit. Sure. If you have a system where you can identify that and then go build version three, uh, when like a very small subset of users are on that early V0, awesome, do that. But I think the problem is we're trying to find product market fit as cheap as possible. And then when we find it, we keep building on that awful V0. I think nobody has doubt that Twitter has product market fit. I think we can afford it. If you add new features, we don't know. We don't know if Twitter Blue is right. going to have product market fit. And I know well, that. I, I can't change my profile picture right now because I'm a Twitter Blue user. I had an automation set up to change my profile picture whenever I went live. And it didn't error out when I had changed or when I became verified through Blue. And now I can't change my picture anymore. My account's in this weird locked state. Just growing they pains. Rush the feature Just out to test Ooh. it. It's not, no, it's not growing pains. It's, no, it's, not it's experimenting pains. in favor of product market fit. Yeah, I, I, I've got the, the, the tweet pinned up here at top. Uh, sorry if that's, if that's not okay, but I just thought I'd. I would, but uh, like I, I think that it's true though. Like it would be awesome to have more feedback mechanisms into the core teams at Twitter. So like if like there's a feature that just makes a lot of fucking sense, like like you could just have that feedback directly from the users or something is broken, I mean, and then look. getting those information systems into the core teams so that they can really iterate on that on that product market fit. You know, I mean, obviously, you can... already has it, but. You know, you can you can at anybody at Comma, and you can discuss their features with them. Um, I can't speak to Twitter, but I could say you know, Comma. Everyone's pretty much on Twitter. 
um, then you know you can you can you can add them and ask for features. Uh, I don't know. Like I love building in public. I, I think that so much secrecy is incredibly stupid. Uh, I think it would be so cool if Elon actually dropped uh, a, a three gigabyte tarball Dude, full of If he Twitter did that, that would actually be insane. <laughs> if he actually you want, opened you it. You want to sit there and try to read it? You're welcome to my last four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would just, it would actually like, like that would be mind blowing. You know, if he just was like, yeah, here, you fucking solve it. <laughs> I mean, no, you're like, okay, I, I hope he actually doesn't do that because who knows how many secrets are in that code base. I don't mean secrets like, uh, like 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 IP secrets. I mean secrets like a literal like AWS uh, 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 token. Oh, right, everyone's got those in their private code business. Uh, all right, Ashak's got his hand up. Yes. Um, hi. Um, is there any ideas and possibilities on having unique profile pictures to reduce fake profiles or reduce uh, abuse? Wait. The last thing that you can possibly ask me about is Twitter features. By the way, I'm in the Twitter should build zero features camp um, and should just do refactors for the next six months. Uh, so that's, that's, that's my take on any asks for Twitter features. But, uh, you know, look, I'm not even at Twitter anymore. I don't even work there. I resigned. Were that. you joking? So you actually uh, worked there? What were you doing? I was trying to fix all this <laughs> shit. <laughs> I literally live across the street. How do I go to help fix all the React bullshit? Um, all oh, the React bullshit. I, look, I don't work there. I don't. I don't know hey, about any of this. I mean, this. Is George, I, I got a question email. about comma. Actually, all so, right, all right. So let's say the best case scenario is uh, comma turns into like a five hundred billion dollar company, right? How many? How, I don't know if that's the best case scenario. That sounds like people want to come take it from me. What do you mean by that? I don't give a shit about the money. The money's fake, guys. Do you believe in the singularity? <laughs> okay, or not? okay. The money does not matter. The singularity. Yeah, matters. okay. Conspiracy aside, right? But um, how 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 big? It's a social. Yeah, construct. okay. All the money's fake. I, I I know. I know. All right, yeah. The money's fake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, go on. Um, how how big would comma grow? Because you can't operate that. Like you would need at least a team for compliance alone. Compliance. With what? Uh, I don't know, like people getting in car crashes. What if people get in car crashes? What does that have to do with me? Because uh, you're the CEO and you'd be responsible. But that, that, that's, that's not... That's no, not no, 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 no. Comma's a level two system. And it's open source. Well, the goal is to be level, uh, level four, right? Or full... The goal is definitely not to be level four. I have no idea. Who oh, they just are so driving. Level two forever. Oh. Actually, you know what the long term goal of Comma is? The long term goal of Comma is to have a shop in the mall where you go in and you buy your new Comma body, and you bring your Comma body home with you, and it cleans your house, <laughs> and it it cooks you some food, and you know you can even have sex with it if you want. Now that is the goal of Comma, right? What's your compliance? Dude, go to go to my store at the mall. Drop twenty grand. Walk home with your comma body, hand in hand. With how much shade you still show? I'm, I'm surprised Elon came into your space, dude. It's so funny. What? The Elon came into my space? Yeah, I'm surprised. Uh, dude, Elon, Elon, chill, man. <laughs> He's a troll too. I get it. No, we're he was all... not happy when he asking about ad tech initially. I Thank you that. for defending me. On I, I, I defended you. The, uh, yeah, I appreciate. No. That. I got mad respect for you for that. I did not expect it at all. Thank you. Thank you. No, look, I think I think he was pissed with the other guy, and I think he thought everyone else was like that. The other guy was literal, like just 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 annoying him. But no, I mean, you, look, what you said about ad tech was like absolutely right, and anyone who works on ads like knows this. Yeah, which is yeah, I, I was surprised he. <sighs> It sucks because, like, I really want Twitter to survive, and ads are how you survive in this economy, and it just doesn't get a lot of it. Uh. Yeah, look, you know what? Whenever I think about Elon, whenever I think about a decision that Elon's making, I remind myself that he's a billionaire and I'm not. Um, so whatever his process is for making decisions, it's better than mine. So I have a thing I call reset theory, where it's very easy when you go from one place to another in terms of like areas of expertise to think that your current expertise carries over because you're an expert, you're on top of your shit. 
And I made this mistake when I was on top of my game as an engineer thinking, oh, I can move over to running a company. No, I can't. It's not that easy. It's really hard to do. I thought when I was popular on YouTube, I could just move that over to TikTok. No, I absolutely can't. It's really hard to do. Going from one type of company to another, from a space where customers are paying you money to a space where advertisers are paying you money to have customers watch their stuff is such a huge shift that it's easy to see like certain patterns and like the, the fundamental truths, the one dimensional solutions that you're familiar with, which in Elon's case are people like your thing, people buy your thing, thing will be successful. That's not true in this space. And like the axes you've defined yourself on aren't even like the same here. I mean, I think it can be true. Like, I think that one of the things that's baffling to me, you look at Twitter's old things, how is this company possibly spending $5.5 billion? Yeah, there's like, like, there's two extremes here, and they're way past the like, too big extreme. But there are, and like, I agree, Twitter's spending way too much money, they're way too big. They had a lot of debt from both technically and like, the architecture of like the company itself and financially and financially they're they were fucked on all of these dimensions yeah. but that doesn't mean elon's knowledge of how to start a business successfully necessarily carries over to how to make a successful advertising platform on a given yeah. social media product and a lot of the things he's used for his successful career are specifically like harmful in this space like those truths don't exist here but you're talking about somebody who sold flamethrowers out and burnt hairspray uh, i think like out of anything he does know how to generate money and this is just it's almost like thinking outside of the box where you just have to apply it in different ways and obviously limit your your spending in some ways but um i think it's just uh you know, fine tuning his expertise in other companies here and really learning as he goes. Like he's not an expert there. He didn't really understand the code base or how um, chaotic it is. You know, somebody who like I worked at GM and you have a lot of legacy shit where they keep stacking shit and they get some new integration tool and everything's just this big ball of different technologies that don't really even connect well, but they just work. And once they work, people just don't want to dive in there and refactor it. So I, I think it's just more so of, you know, getting the right guys behind it that can um, connect the web a little well, bit better than it already is. Th there definitely are some truths to running an advertising based business, but at the same time, this business is not being built from scratch, right? Like Twitter was bought for $44 billion. Uh, you only need to make this thing profitable to stay alive, right? There are a huge number of users on the platform that even though you might not be doing ads as efficiently as, as, as Meta, uh, it may not matter if all you're trying to do is stay alive because the fundamental cost to run something like Twitter, this isn't a car company. At a car company, you have margins, and your margins are kind of razor thin, right? Like you got to buy all these parts from somewhere, right? You don't make the wheels, you buy the wheels. Right? You don't make the engine, you buy the engine. I mean, maybe Tesla makes the engine, but uh, no, GM don't make the engine. Actually, maybe they do make the engine, but they don't make the brakes, they don't make the steering wheel. Um, so there's no real, what's the actual cost to running Twitter? Um, I, I also want to do that... Uh... Uh, Elon's mentioned this before, and I think is, this is like huge, is that he's going to start incentivizing content creators like on Twitter. Um, Features! Like, this. Features! Yeah, but I mean, I think this is going to be a game changer. Features! Who's going to build them? All of the, all the, the like, Substack people, all of the like, YouTubers, you know, all of these people that can make money. They can do it on Twitter. No, I, I mean, yeah. So, like this, I, is, dude. So <laughs> right now, Twitter doesn't have a path to profitability. I, I we've said a couple things throughout up the space. Like Twitter has product market fit. It has product market fit for a product and a market, but we don't know how much money it can make. And there's two paths. We can try and raise the potential for money to be made, so that it can either raise more money, so it can get more runway and be bigger. Or we can pick, we can say, okay, Twitter is good enough today 
we're going to trim everything from here, from the waist down, so that we know we can fit it under the amount of money it can make at this moment. It is hard to do both at the same time. And when we choose to refactor now, we are choosing to do the latter. Also, one of the things from a feature standpoint that you got to realize is uh, like with Twitch, for example, right? Twitter Spaces is one of the reasons why Twitter Spaces is so special is because you're not, there is no video. You are just doing voice. You're able to focus on that conversation. And when you they add copy Clubhouse, when you add in video, right? This You're creating an arms race now. It's like with Twitch, right? Like as soon as you have video now, as soon as somebody starts getting like a green screen, it starts doing picture overlays, it starts doing animations and starts doing, uh, get, getting a ring light. Like it, it levels up the quality bar, and now now there's like a the, the the barrier to entry starts to get larger over time. It creeps up, and this is what happened with Twitch. And now, like if you were to start streaming on Twitch and be competitive, if you think that's what happened, like like you've said some stupid shit, but saying that's what happened to Twitch really like icing on the cake. God, yeah, that's exactly what happened, and it's also why like. I just, I did, I disagree. That that's happening with Twitch. I, I, I stream on Twitch with the absolute lowest budget bullshit, and I get a lot of viewers. I'm literally streaming on Twitch right now to a thousand viewers, and I'm using a three hundred dollars. Yeah, but you can't make a living off like streaming to a thousand people. I, yeah, I. No, you I can. can, especially since my you YouTube gets two million views a month. Videos that I produce on Twitch. I worked at Twitch for fucking half a decade. I know how the shit works, man. You yeah you can you can be successful those things uh, yeah this is like I, I I think this is the same people who think you need a fancy keyboard in order to program uh, I think these things the high end people get them but I don't think they really have much to do with your success at all they don't have to do with your success hey, but a... but it absolutely limits the pool of people who can find success right the, there's always going to be the outliers there's always going to be the exceptional people who find something creative to do they do v- dude you can buy a six hundred dollar like, phone from Apple, Apple. what. Yeah. You can buy a six hundred dollar phone from Apple and be a top YouTuber with it right now, no questions asked. Like the quality you can get of like recording and quality, both video and audio, on a cheap Apple device from the store day one is insane. I was I was, I was actually just, just looking into I was looking into buying like a real high end video camera, um, <laughs> and then I like was watching some stuff, and then I was shooting some stuff with my my iPhone thirteen, and I'm like. It's not really that different. No, but good luck being good, good luck being successful without being able to graphic edit your thumbnails, without being having t- uh, title cards and yeah. slates. And these things matter tangibly to watch. Watch my stream. So long you have no idea how I can easily again discoverability. This is so fun for li- making a living. Yeah. It's all about that following. All right, all right, all right, all right. off topic. Uh, do we want to end it with one key thing: the scale, complexity, number of engineers. We all agreed that we only need 20 engineers. The trick is finding the right 20 engineers. Um, everything can be built with 20 engineers, except rockets. They might need 50. I think One the framing I want to offer you for this, George, this is the thing I try yeah. to talk a lot about. I think about problems in dimensions, and it should be our goal as engineers not to make the, the dimension we're working within as rigid as possible. It should be to have as few dimensions as possible. So things like auto scaling, that's a dimension you have to work to maintain. Things like global distribution, that's a dimension you've added to of complexity. You can make those rock hard, or rock solid and hard and keep them like in good places, but you're fucked as soon as you have to make changes. My goal is almost always to reduce those dimensions and make it as simple as possible. And tools like serverless are a great example of how to do that. And I think that that's the future we're going to see. That's really exciting is a future where we're able to reduce complexity, not by picking better languages or writing better code with better engineers, but simply fucking like building things that don't have those problems in the first place. Yeah, and I, I think I think that's the real truth of the ChatGPT revolution. It's it's not going to be whether you ask your ChatGPT to write Python or Scala. Like I think we can almost abstract away the programming language. When can the AI just directly do the compute? I think the issue with ChatGPT is that you know there there are certain things that it won't be able to know, like the integration or the creativity that comes from the engineers, or like certain times where they Total ask bullshit. it to. Total bullshit. Total yeah. bullshit. Uh, I, I promise you that creativity is is absolutely nothing, and the AIs will blow out of the water any human creativity. Very well, soon. I won't say creativity, but more so of like asking it to write a React application. It's using deprecated um, libraries, so staying up to speed, or depending on how many things you actually want integrated with it, like how in depth will those will there be like a questionnaire to be able to build everything or kind of like a, I guess a build, I don't know, a, 
like a glitch. As far as staying up to date goes, those things can read the internet so much faster. I can retrain the model so much faster than a human could read a book, right? Well, actually, that's not exactly true, but like you, you, you could imagine this kind of being true in the limit. Um, the new, the new systems that I think are going to move to right, right now, they store all the information in the weights, but you could store all the information in like kind of like a memory bank, and you can do retrieval systems. Facebook just came out with a paper on this, but um, I, I don't imagine it being a questionnaire. I imagine it being a conversation. But I, I, I think that there's something to this, though, that the like AI can't really like there, there are different kinds of creativity, right? Like AI can take different ideas and synthesize from different domains way better than any human could, right? Because it just has such an insane breadth. But that breadth is composed of all stuff that humans already know. Right? So is yours. Running on top of. So is yours. So, like, there, there's, some, there's some types of creativity that AI, I think, will never this is really not- achieve. It's, it's more a, a tool. But it, there is- are some domains and some things that it will create, obviously. Right. I promise you guys that this stuff is not true. There is no type of creativity that the humans have that is unique to them. You say the AI is just a synthesis of already existing ideas. That is all humans are, right? There is absolutely no difference. Well, and you know what? Everyone, I, who do, everyone who doesn't believe this is going to be in for a sad awakening, I think. Whoa. I'm almost entirely with you. My one piece of pushback is that AI has these levels of creativity. The thing it doesn't have is understanding. And I think that is where humans excel. What is their ability to under? What is understanding? When something's working, why is it working? That's something you can use AI to help it give you additional insight on, but the decision, like there will always be a level of decision-making that comes down to a human and we will keep moving that higher and higher up and keep getting like to do cooler things as a result. But we're always moving layers. We're not necessarily removing humans. This is okay. So this is, this is, this is a, 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 a smarter take on it. I I still think it's wrong, but I think it's less obvious that it's wrong. I, I think that it's that AI, I don't think will create new paradigms of thought, you know? Like AI will will incrementally improve and synthesize a bunch of different things, but we're we're not going to get a whole new paradigm of of like green open field. Does, does that make sense? Well, no, I, yeah. Um, both, both of you are wrong. This, we've already passed this point. Um, yeah. OpenAI wrote that uh, Dota bot a while back, and it was like inventing uh, like new strategies and like metas in the game that like pro players have never seen. And then they were trying to play against the open AI bot to get better at it. Uh, we're like at the point where we're learning from AI. It, it's it's like the human's wrong or doesn't. Yeah, there, there, there's definitely no paradigm type of creativity. Any of this, none of that's true. Um, there is a question of the agency of AI. Um, Theo, maybe that's what you were getting at. You're like, well, so the AI is always going to sit below humans. It's just going to be like, does it sit right below executives, right? Like, as you kind of move up in an org chart. Um... Uh, yes, to an extent. There's a level of, like, which product should we build next? And when different products have different responses from users, which should we double down on? Which engineers or which people don't necessarily make sense to but, keep? But AI can help guide us to the right decisions for a lot of these things. What, but no. if you... Okay, go ahead. But... My concern is the cost of certain, like AI making expensive decisions easier to make is different from AI making expensive decisions. And it will be a long time, if ever, where we should let AI regularly make the expensive decisions for us when we could instead use its insight. And if we disagree with the AI's decisions and make different ones and fuck up as a result, there is a person who you can hold accountable for that. And I think that... <laughs> yeah. did, you, did, you, did you see that on Twitter? The, the IBM memo from 1970? Computers can never make decisions because they can't be held accountable. <laughs> yes. And I, I do think that's a real problem outside of the dev world. I don't. I, I feel um, like one of the so, things AI will never have is experience, learned experience, right? I can read all I want about childbirth. I'm never going to fully understand that experience. And AI will lack that for basically every human experience. And I, I don't. After he said that that way, I understand why you were so against my take, George. Uh, okay, we're we're the, the 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 people with takes on AI that really make no sense. Uh, just from, from speakers. Um, I mean, like 
I, I, look, I, I, I can... The, the problem with these things is you get at the bottom of what these people are generally saying, and they eventually get to something like, um, AI can ex- can't experience qualia, and you can. The AI will never know the touch of human skin, and this is just completely meaningless. Uh, there is no such thing as consciousness. There's no such thing as qualia. Now, to talk about the difference between tools and agents, that is a real thing. That is a real thing that has a real science. Uh, you know, you can, the, the, the loss functions look different, right? Um, so agents usually come when the loop is closed. And to come to your exact example about products, you're like, well, the AI is not going to choose the product, right? The AI is going to help the humans. The humans are going to look at how the product's performing. The humans are going to tweak the product, put the new one out, maybe with the help of the AI. Yeah, but why not just close the loop entirely? Um, and if your worry is because you're afraid, well, the computer can't be held accountable when it's terrible. I mean, maybe today where humans and AIs are on kind of similar-ish playing fields, humans are actually still better. Sure. But someone's eventually not going to have that taboo and that company's going to crush you. Hey, George, I have a question about modern security. Um what what do you what do you think about like the new iPhones and the new consoles and like they're much more difficult to hack uh, compared to like back in uh, two thousand seventeen when there was like the iPhone three GS on like the Xbox three. That was a long time. Was a long time before two thousand seventeen. I mean two thousand seven. Yeah, I mean, so when you say they've gotten harder to hack, you can quantify this. You can talk about how many dollars an exploit costs, right? And the price of exploits has gone up a lot. Yeah, yeah, and you have to be a near expert. Like, you can't be a teenager doing this, right? Yeah, the best people are probably still teenagers or close to teenagers. They always are. Uh, it's just one of those things that selects for... I promise you the best exploiter in the world today is probably, like, 24. Um, you know, it's just... I, I don't know who they are. I haven't kept up with the scene, but I bet you that's true. Because it's just, like, the way your mind works. Uh, but, yeah, the cost has gone up a lot. But I don't know, that actually might not be because it's harder. It's, it's harder to say if it's actually more difficult. Like, I'm not sure I could really do it anymore. But it's like, you know, then I watched the generation before me. I watched like Charlie Miller be like, oh, there's ASLR now. It's hard. And, you know, ASLR was never a thing for me. And now you have these like new kids who are like, yeah, of course it takes nine exploits. And we have to break out of three sandboxes. No big deal, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I was just curious. Um... The other thing, too, is I, I was just reading that the, like, Gen Z is less technically advanced uh, than, like, mil- millennials, if that makes sense. The youth, the youth, man, the world is falling. The youth are corrupt. What, what do you think? And Socrates said that. That was all bullshit, man. You think so? It was less technically. The, 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 the Greeks were complaining about how the youth were corrupt and couldn't do X. And they didn't know the virtue. Whatever, whatever. Right? This, is, this is a meaningless thing. Hey George. All right, cool. Hey George, I just have a question. Do you have any unfinished uh, dream ideas for Twitter, or weren't they listened, or anything that you still feel that is pending with Twitter? No, look, I don't work with Twitter anymore. Um, I don't know. I, I think I think one of the main things it comes down to is Elon wants to build features, and I would do refactors. Um, but I did like that Elon said that. Uh, even if it's not me, I do hope the Twitter employees get some good quality food. <laughs> Though the food matters a lot to me. Man. It's important for me, no? Come on, like George, you might need to change your profile picture to I do not work at Twitter anymore. Don't ask me Twitter questions. Yeah, we're gonna get a few people who ask me Twitter questions. I'll start coming up with good snippy responses. Maybe I'll start spreading misinformation. You know, I love spreading misinformation. Um all right, cool. Thank you everyone for being in my space. Check out Kama's Twitter tomorrow. We got a fire video dropping. It's going to be good. DM me so we can schedule that podcast. All right. Sounds good. I'll follow you. DM me. Yeah. Cool.